to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1. We begin with verse 19. Tonight we'll study the life of Joseph the carpenter. Joseph the carpenter. It is a great possibility as I start this sermon that we don't think too much about this character in the Christmas story. But as far as I know, Joseph must have been either 10 or 15 years older than Mary. I'm just surmising that because he was passed away long before Mary had passed away and uh, left her a widow. And there's some questions I'm going to ask when I get to heaven. I know there were children by Joseph and Mary as well. And I know that when Jesus died on the cross that Jesus looked to John, not a brother of Jesus and said behold thy mother and John took care of Mary the rest of his life as far as tradition goes and as far as we know I'm going to think and I'm going to ask the question when I get to heaven what happened to all the siblings even though they were half brothers and half sisters I want to know what happened to them why weren't they taking care of Mary I don't think they all passed away I do know one thing for sure, that the spiritual connection with Jesus and John and Mary was of utmost importance. In fact, when Jesus was approached one time and said, Behold, your brethren and your mother is outside waiting for you. And he said, These, and he's pointing to his disciples, These are my mother and my brethren. So he held, upheld the spiritual connection uh, greatly. So I don't know all about some of these things, but I want to delve into the life of Joseph for just a little bit tonight. And if I have to continue it, I will. Start with verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David... Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I'm glad it's got an S on the end of sin, aren't you? Amen. Amen. Now all this was done that it might be, be fulfilled, which was spoken by, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. <clears throat> then Joseph being raised from deep sleep, from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife <clears throat> and knew her not till that she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. I want to give you some thoughts on this tonight before we leave. <coughs> First of all, I want you to notice in verse 19 that uh, Jesus was, uh, jo Joseph, was a just man. And so I want to give us a lesson on righteous living. Joseph is a type of believer who lives the right kind of life. Now, this is not my outline, but it is part of my outline. So we're going to see in verse 19 a lesson on righteous living. And Joseph being a just man, verse 19. And then in verse uh, 20 through 25, we have a lesson on responsibility. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, that's thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And knew her not, knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn, and he called him his name Jesus. That's a lesson in responsibility from those couple of verses, verse 20 through 25 and 20 and 21 specifically. And then there's another lesson here. Here's a lesson on religion. A lesson on righteous living, a lesson on responsibility, and a lesson on religion. Now let me give you one verse from the book of James, who was a half-brother of the Lord. He says in James 1, 27, 
But pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I really wonder where James was. I wonder what happened. You say, well, he was uh, martyred, thrown down from the wall of uh, the temple. Well, we don't know when exactly that was. Verse 39, and when they had performed all things this, according to the uh, law of the Lord, they returned unto Galilee to their own son Nazareth, own city Nazareth, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. That's Luke chapter 2, in case you were wondering where I was. Those are lessons on responsibility. We had lessons on righteous living. We had lessons on responsibility, and we had lessons on religion. That was the third one. So I want to think a little bit about righteous living for just a minute. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, he was an honorable man. The first day, let me explain something about the Jewish wedding so you'll understand what's going on here. And it'll take me a minute to set the scene for this. So he was an honorable husband. Listen to this description of a Jewish wedding. The first stage of an ancient Jewish marriage involved the prospective bridegroom visiting the father of the prospective bride. First, he would state to the father his desire for the father's daughter and ask for her hand in marriage. If the father agreed to uh, the match, he would then begin to negotiate a price to be paid for the future bride. If the father and the bridegroom agreed on a price, then the groom would pay, thus establishing that the marriage would take place and that the bride would be his. We don't do that much anymore, but I bet there's some people that would like for that to happen for the groom to pay a price for the bride. I wonder what price would be set on some of these young ladies. Anyway, let's go on. Second, once the bridegroom paid the purchase price, the marriage covenant was established. That was it. Paid the price, it was, it was done basically. And the young man and the woman were regarded as future husband and wife. From that moment on, the bride was set apart exclusively for the bridegroom. This is the period of time that she is observed for her purity. This is also the period of time that the bride is being trained and prepared to take on the role of a wife, and she prepares herself to be a fitting bride for her mate. We don't have much of that training going on today, but I think it would probably be a good idea for future brides to be trained. Don't you think that would be a good idea? You say, well, what about the males? Yeah, they should be too, I'm sure. So thirdly, as a symbol of the covenant relationship that had been established, the groom and the bride drank from a cup of grape juice, over which the betrothal had been pronounced. So they symbolized the uh, betrothal with the drinking of a cup of grape juice. Fourthly, after the marriage covenant was established, the groom left his bride at her home and returned to his father's house, where he remained separated from his bride. During this period of separation, the groom prepared a dwelling place in his father's house to which he would bring, uh, bring his bride later. Fifthly, at the end of the period of separation, i got a lot to say about those things, but don't have time right now. The bridegroom came usually at night to take his bride to live with him. The groom, the best man, and other male escorts went to meet the bridegroom with lit torches and left the father's house and conducted a torch-like procession to the home of the bride. Although the bride was expecting her groom to come for her, she did not know the time of his coming. As a result, the groom's arrival was preceded by a shout which announced his departure to be gathered with him. Those on the street, knowing that a groom was coming to claim his bride, would begin to shout, Behold, the bridegroom comes! Behold, the bridegroom comes! Sixthly, when the groom received his bride, together with her female attendants, the enlarged wedding party returned from the bride's home to be to the groom's father's house, where the wedding guests had assembled. Shortly after they arrived, the bride and the groom were escorted by the other members of the wedding party to the bridal chamber. Prior to entering the chamber, the bride remained veiled so that no one could see her face. While the groomsman and the bridesmaid waited outside, the bride and groom entered the bridal chamber alone. This is the prophecy they entered into. In this prophecy, they entered into the physical union for the first time, thereby consummating the marriage that had been coveted approximately one year before. After the marriage was consummated, the groom came out of the bridal chamber and announced the uh, consummation of the marriage to the members of the wedding party waiting outside. Then as the groom went back to his bride in the chamber, the members of the wedding party returned to the wedding guests and announced the consummation of the marriage. The couple would then leave the banquet hall and begin their new life together. 
going to the place the groom had prepared for his new bride. Now, can I tell you something? I said all of that to say this. Joseph and Mary were part of this process. This was a thing that the Jews would do. So he would be involved. She would be involved in this. And the Jewish wedding is a symbol of uh, redemption, buying and paying the price. And Joseph was an honorable husband, just as Jesus Christ is an honorable husband. I'm so glad that we have Jesus Christ not only as our Savior, but as our honorable husband. So Joseph is a type of that honorable husband. And Jesus paid the price of his blood. Aren't you glad Jesus paid the price? And aren't you glad you're the bride of Christ? Amen. And if, as the bride, Jesus is your husband. Thank God for the picture of the Jewish wedding that pictures redemption. So we see an honorable man. He's going through the whole process. But in that process, he's going to find out during that year of separation that Mary was with child. And he was minded to put her away privately. Now, he could have put her away publicly. He could have had her taken to the gate and stoned, but he didn't. Or he could give her a private written uh, law or a notice of divorcement. And that was what he had intended to do, just to privately give her a writing of divorcement. So he was an honorable man. And so here's what I'd like to say about that. As we live for Jesus Christ today, all of us ought to be honorable male and female. We ought to do what's right. So in this wedding process, Joseph was doing what he knew was right. He was an honorable man. But he was also a just man or a moral man. Jeez, Joseph was a just man, and that has the meaning of moral fairness and honesty and peace and precise judgment. This book so de defined Israel that they call themselves simply the people of the book. They were not people of oil or people of the grape vines or something like that. The Jewish people were known as people of the book. So other people were known for other things. People of armies, people of power, uh, people of industry, or something like that. But Israel was not known for power. Israel was not known for other things. It was known as people of the book. So here's this just man, Joseph. He's part of the people of the book. And we ought to be just like Joseph, a person of the book. So he grew up teaching the book or knowing the book. And all the Jewish males would be taught to be a rabbi. So Joseph was probably in that same process of being taught to be a rabbi. He was a just man. He was a moral man. He was to be a man of the book. That's what he was. When a young man fell in love and wanted to be married to a young woman in order to ascertain whether or not he was worthy of their daughter, the custom was that her family would give this prospective groom a test on the knowledge of the Torah. So if Joseph came along to the parents of Mary and said, I'm interested in Mary. I want her to be my bride. The first thing that had to happen was he would be tested on the Torah to see how much he knew of the Torah. And if he knew the Tanakh, then he would, uh, he would be de deserving of the bride. So the more desirable, now listen to this, the more desirable the girl was, the more beautiful and intelligent she was, and the more wealthy her family was, the higher score on the test was what it took to get that girl. So if you wanted a real nice young lady, you had to know the book, the Tanakh. So it, this somebody said this, and I think it bears repeating. I love it. It was the only education system where if you passed the test, you lost your bachelor's degree. Amen. How many of you like that? I think that's a good idea. So here was Joseph probably had been given a test by Mary's parents. That was the custom. So he was a just man. In 19, that was somebody to do right. He was an honorable man, a moral man, and he was a thoughtful man. He meditated. He thought about some things before he was acting, and he thought on these things, it says in verse 20. He thought on these things. 
Paul, who was also well educated in the Tanakh, said in his letter to the Philippians, and I like this verse, one of my favorites, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Paul knew the Tanakh, and he knew that you're supposed to think on the right things. And so Joseph thought on these things when he heard the angel saying to him, he, he said, Mary's with child, and uh, the angel comes to him. Uh, he's thinking on these things. So he's a thoughtful man, and he's an obedient man. He did as the angel of the Lord told him or bid him to do. So here is a comment from somebody about Joseph. If a type is to be sought in the character of Joseph, it is that of a simple, honest, hardworking God-fearing man who was possessed of large sympathies and a warm heart. I like that statement about Joseph. Strict in the observance of Jewish law and custom, it was yet ready, he was yet ready when occasion arose to make those subservient to the greater law of the Spirit. Praise the Lord for that. I didn't write that, but that's good. But somebody said he was a loving leader, and I like this. It says, and he took unto him his wife. He took unto him his wife. In other words, he didn't back off from the leadership that was needed. Joseph was a man of compassion. He was not the kind who would do things out of anger, but was careful to consider things dispassionately. This was important for God's plan for the son. The guardian chosen. Now, think about this. He was the guardian chosen to watch over the child Jesus. He was a very special person chosen to watch over the raising of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would make decisions wisely. So he's going to be a loving leader to Joseph, to Jesus. Here we see Joseph confronted with his first test of faith. Sometimes God allows us to go through different, difficult times that we don't understand so that we can learn to place our trust in him. Joseph is told, you just take her to wife. Now, yes, she's with child, but she's a, with the child of the Holy Ghost. I don't know what Joseph thought about that, but I bet you that was a strange thing to his heart. But he did exactly what the angel said. The angel said, take, him, take her as your wife, and he took her as his wife. He was a loving leader, and he was obedient as well. So God gives us difficult times sometimes to test our faith, and that's what was happening to Joseph. But he passed the test. So he not only passed the test to get Mary as his wife, in the, knowing the Tanakh, but he passed the test of faith that the Lord Jesus, uh, that the uh, Holy Spirit gave him. So I think all of us, and I've, I, I want to just get uh, really elaborate sometimes on some of these things, but all of us ought to listen and obey the Holy Spirit, shouldn't we? And Joseph was doing it. I mean, how would you like to have had that, some of the angels, well, if an angel said, Lord, I'll do it. But what if you found out something terrible had happened uh, to your mate? Or so your maid had done something terrible, you thought. Now, what would you do? And he listened to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit said, you'd take her to wife, where most of the time they would have stoned her or either given her a writing of divorcement. Somebody said, and I think this is true, one of the best things that a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Can I say amen to that? Is that good or what? One of the best things that a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Somebody say amen, help me out. Yeah, that's good. I appreciate a little help every now and then. And uh, Luke 4.22, by the way, you know who said that? Anybody want to know who said that? The best thing that a father can do for his children is to love their mother. Would you like to know who said it? James Dobson. How many of you heard of him? Yeah, that's good. A child, let's see, this is Luke, Luke 4.22, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Now, wait just a minute. You say, preacher, that's not very important. Those people of that community, uh, as they saw Jesus and what he was doing and what he was saying, they said and wondered in their mind, is not this Jesus, Joseph's son? Now, think about this. They were, weren't deriding Joseph. They were uplifting Joseph. They were saying that Joseph was the guy that we have been talking about, the honorable man, the just man, and moral man, the obedient man, thoughtful man, and, all, and so on. But they were wondering about Jesus. 
But when they wondered about Jesus, it was, now he's doing some things completely different. He's acting different from anybody else that we've ever seen or heard. And in their mind, isn't this Joseph's son? That's not derogatory toward Joseph. That's saying Joseph was a, a guy that they respected well. So a child is not likely to find a father. In, now, oh, I like this too. This is probably not, not Dobson, but listen to it. A child is not likely to find a father in God unless he finds something of God in the father. Would you like to know? You want me to say that again? Anybody, anybody want to hear that one more time? Here's what it says. A child is not likely to find a father in God unless he finds something of God in the Father. I like that. Who said that? Austin Sorensen, great Bible commentator. Joseph was given two names. Jesus, Joseph was given two names of the promised son. Joseph was given two names of the promised son. Emmanuel from the Old Testament and Jesus as a new revelation. This is completely new. The Lord in Isaiah said the virgin, by the way, I didn't know this, I hadn't thought about it much, but the virgin in Isaiah not only represents Mary, but it also represents the nation of Israel. So we have to put that little thought in there as well. The Lord in Isaiah said the virgin who represented the nation of Israel would call his name Emmanuel. So Emmanuel was a national name. Emmanuel was a name for the nation of Israel, God with us. By the angel in Matthew would call his name a uh, they that they believe in this would also those in New Testament also were going to call his name Emmanuel. And so that Jesus Aunt Joseph and Mary would both call him Jesus, and that's his human name. Thank the Lord. I, I'll tell you one thing. There's some more about Jesus, I'll tell you that more about it. What was the reason for calling him Jesus? Why would they change it from Emmanuel to Jesus? Well, Jesus is the human part. Emmanuel was the national part. So I'm glad that I can still call him Jesus. Aren't you glad you have a name that is above every name? The name of Jesus. Don't you like that name? How many of you like the name Jesus? Jesus. There's something about that name. I like that. So here's what Jesus is broken down into. And let me give you a couple of that. So the scripture tells us that uh, Jesus means God is salvation. And scripture clearly indicates that there is one Savior, Jehovah. And he must be manifested in himself as Jesus for him to be able to save his people. We see this in his name. J-E is the abbreviation for Jehovah. So when you see J-E in the name Jesus, that's the abbreviation for Jehovah. And then if you look at the last part of his name, that uh, S-U-S is the abbreviation for Savior. So now we see what the name means. Jehovah saves. Aren't you glad the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament and both save? I'm glad I'm saved, aren't you? You see, Jesus saves. Do you believe Jesus saves? Amen. Amen. It is what he came to do, how he did it and who he did it for. His name identifies his person. He is Jehovah Savior. Savior means to deliver, to preserve, to keep, to protect, and to save. Jesus was the Old Testament Savior of the chosen nation of Israel. There's that Emmanuel coming back in again. Jesus was the New Testament Savior of the godly remnant of Israel. Jesus is the past, present, and future Savior of all who put their faith and trust in his sacrifice. Jesus is his human name. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is his prophesied name. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. There's that son of Joseph again. Jesus is his redemptive name. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Jesus is his gospel name. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Jesus is his resurrection name. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Jesus is his glorified and exalted name. Wherefore God also hath given, highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, 
and things un under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus. What a name. But Joseph is only known in the shadows. Jesus is the one that took the spotlight. But Joseph was chosen by God to rear Jesus. And Joseph was the one to whom the Holy Spirit said, you'll call his name Jesus. He's the kind of person who had a reputation throughout his community. His integrity, integrity his faith, and his willingness to help others must have been noticed. So as Jesus begins his ministry, he is honored as the son of Joseph. Joseph may not seem very important to us 2,000 years or so later, but to God, Joseph the carpenter was extremely important for he was chosen to watch over the care of young Jesus. What an honor and what a privilege. There's no doubt in my mind that God had chosen the right man. My question for us is this. Are we the right person to care for God's only begotten son? Are we the right person to care for God's only begotten son? Let's pray.